The German occupied Czechoslovakia in 1939. At that time I was 14 years old. So I was a little bit younger than you were when we met, right? <coughs> uh, for me, at the beginning, it was like an adventure. When you are 14 years old, anything that is happening is an adventure. Of course, when we were occupied by German, it was serious and I was Jewish. So all the Jewish laws of the Germany became valid in the former Czechoslovakia, which split in two countries, the eastern part Slovakia, declared independence and collaborated with Germany. The western part, which was Bohemia and Moravia, became part of the great Germany and they, it was called protectorate, that we were like, protected by the Germans against everything. Uh, Anti-Jewish anti laws became valid in, the, in Bohemia, in the protectorate, which meant that we were not permitted to attend public schools. And there were no private schools in, in Czechoslovakia, and even the private schools wouldn't accept Jews. So since, nine, since 1930, ni 1940, which I was at the time 15 years old, I couldn't attend any school and I had to work as a laborer. At the beginning, <coughs> the young children, uh, I, mean, they, I was not a child, at the, we, were, we had to come every morning to the city hall and were assigned some streets that we had to clean, wipe, just keep them clean. Later we were assigned uh, military barracks that were occupied then by German soldiers and we had to clean the barracks. Fortunately for us, at the time I was 16, 17 years old, there was a uh, guy, he was, co he was uh, co-owner and, and manager of a co special co-op with about 15-20 people who produced special tools for workers. And he got the idea that he, should, he could hire for a cheap payment Jews who needed to be employed, <coughs> get a contract from a big factory to produce new radios, build a special barrack for them and keep them as a laborer. And he hired over 60, relatively young, between 17 to 25 to 30 years old Jewish people who were working there. We were paid pretty solid money and we were not disturbed. <coughs> so since 1941, 1942, I work as a laborer uh, constructing radios. The, it was a line construction, which means each of us was sitting and uh, radios were moving to our place. We took them off the rails, put them in the front of our, on our table, inserted few things, put them back on the line and shipped them to, to the neighbor. I was at the end of the line, which means that I was tuning. That had one advantage. Early in the afternoon, there was BBC news from England in Czech language that I can tune on. The manager who, who hired us knew about it. He left, went to his office and listened to the news there. Then after the news ended, we, were, we had two people watching out of the window to be sure that no one will come in because they would put us in the prison and send us to concentration camp. But everybody in the shop was listening to the news because at that time we were not permitted to have radios, so this was the only information we got outside the Germany. So after we listened to the news, I just retuned the radio back to the local stations and everything was fine. At the end of 1942, uh, actually before uh, Hitler decided that the Jews have to be sent away or separated from non-Jewish people totally, which means that we had to be taken to some concentration camps. And they found a small town uh, on the border of uh, 
the former Czechoslovakia and Germany that was built in 18th, 18th century and it was a military town. The name of the town was Theresien or Theresienstadt in German and that was the name after the German uh, queen, her, her son Josephus named the town after her. And it was a military town because it has a lot of military barracks and military occupy and was watching the business street, business connection between the Germany, Austria and Czechoslovakia or Czech Republic, Czechoslovakia at that time. <coughs> I lived there with my parents, but we were separated. I stayed with my father in one, one military barrack. My mother stayed in just a private barrack that was converted so in such a way that in every room, instead of one or two persons, there were eight, ten or twelve persons living in the barracks. But it was relatively, compared to some other concentration camps, it was relatively good place to be because we were watched not by German, not by SS men, but by Czech, uh, Czech uh, policemen and they were relatively solid people. Some of them even collaborated with the Jews by permitting them contact with the outside world. At the end of the war practically, in 19, end of 1944, when no one believed that something could happen, the German realized that there may be some uprising in concentration camps and they decided quietly to clean the Theresienstadt, to send all the healthy, relatively young people away so that they could just do any, anything to, at the end of the war. They didn't tell us that they are sending us to Auschwitz. We knew about, we didn't, know, we didn't know about gas chambers, but we knew that Auschwitz is very bad concentration camp because whoever was sent there stopped writing, just disappeared. No one returned back, no one was sent anywhere. People were sent to Auschwitz, but once they went there, they disappeared. So we were afraid to get there. They told us that we are sending, we are sent close to Theresienstadt to build a labor camp. But my father and myself, we were sent at the beginning. Everything happened in October 1944. So we were sent by the third transport and we ended in, in Auschwitz. <coughs> That's where my Big Odyssey actually started. Uh, once we arrived to Auschwitz, we were separated because there was so-called selection. Uh, uh, Dr. Mengele, who was in charge of so-called health, uh, health group in Auschwitz, with another officer, came to the railway station. We had to stay in the line and one after the other came in front of these two officers. They looked at, uh, at the person, asked sometimes some questions about the health or something, and then sent the person either to the right side or to the left side. My father walked in front of me. I watched, he answered one or two questions, were sent to the right side. And there was a big group behind the, uh, behind the railways and this group was marched then directly to the gas chambers and killed. I was at that time not yet 20, healthy. They didn't ask me anything, looked at me, sent me to the other side and marched me then into the concentration camp, into some barracks. And these were people who were assigned for slave labor in concentration camp. And at that time, German doctors calculated the amount of food we were permitted to get so that we die from hunger or disease or something in about three months. But for three months they just, ex they just used us as slaves. So that was the beginning of my final concentration camp experience. 
after being in, Au in Auschwitz-Birkenau for about two or three weeks, I was sent with some 40 other people about 20, 30 miles away to a so-called uh, site camp called Gliwitz in a big Polish city, Gliwice, and was assigned to a German German Polish factory that was repairing and keeping ma in maintenance uh, railways and and tracks. I worked there well from end of October till beginning of January, when the Soviets started a big offensive, and for some reason German decided not to leave any any slaves or people from concentration camp in former Poland, but marched us day and night to the west. After three days I was absolutely exhausted and whoever couldn't walk anymore was shot on the way. So it was called Death March. You could follow the march because they were dead bodies lying on the, on the road. So we reached another concentration camp called Blackhammer well, big concentration camp, and arrived there late in the afternoon. I crawled in some empty bed, fell asleep immediately. Next day I woke up and the camp was empty. Uh, they, walked, they marched all the people away and they forgot me. Either they saw that I am dead or they didn't see me because I was somewhere in the bed. But they let some, some watch outside so I had to stay for two more days in the barrack, not put a head outside, otherwise they will shoot me. After two days they left, the Soviets came, came and that was my liberation. The days were the same. The only difference was that you never knew in the morning if you will be alive in the evening. Okay. You, you know, because there was they could shoot you if they wanted to. Yeah. I was work. There was, it was a, the, the factory was like a big, big uh, railway station with trains and trains and soldiers in between. And when somebody didn't obey, they could shoot you on the spot. Or what they do, they play game because there was a central, uh, central uh, yard and you were not permitted to enter it. And when the, when the soldier didn't want to kill you, but want, to be, went, want you to be dead, he just brought you to the door, opened the door, said, go across the yard to this guy over there and send you. The moment you enter the yard, somebody, another guard, shot you because you were not supposed to be in the yard. Huh? So you were that one way or the other, only the soldier who brought you didn't feel guilty to killing a man. So they, he sent him to kill, so somebody killed him. So, and you never knew if you will... So I try to avoid, avoid the guards always. When I saw the guard, I pretended that I am working or just went away from him. The worst part was you never argue, you never had argument with with the guard, but people at that time were crazy because they were so hungry, so they may have an argument or something. The guard, why should the guard had argument with a prisoner? He either shot him on the spot or brought him somewhere that somebody will shoot him.